and then Mary. Uh, how David and I thought that we might uh, uh, do this is to have each person present a little bit of your ongoing work. Um, I would give some immediate uh, kind of responses, things that stick in my mind or might open doors where you could take it. Uh, watching time to make sure everybody has a chance to speak and then opening it up um, to David's responses and to the wider community there in ways that would be um, constructive um, and surely thinking about critical response as ways to uh, help your research fly to the places that you wish it to reside. Yeah. So certainly not in any evaluative sense, but can we give it uh, a little bit of an updraft uh, so that it goes where you would like it uh, to be? And you surely have wonderful people online here who can say far more uh, than I. But thank you for giving me the opportunity to do that. That said, Chloe, can we turn it over to you? Of course. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Perfect. So. I will apologize firstly, I have building work going on at the moment. Uh, so if you can hear any drilling, hammering, whatever's going on in the background, I apologize and I hope it's not too distracting. I have time, but they're ignoring me. So um, we shall crack on. Um, so what I'm gonna share with you today is something I did as part of my uh, dissertation, which I did with Katrina last year. Um, and I don't want it to be the end of the road for this piece of work. I feel like it's got more in it. And I don't just want it to be this tiny oh, kind of piece yeah, I created for a you know, piece of work dissertation, which was so limited in what you could share that I want to know how we can kind of take this further. Um, so this was part of my master's in sports psychology. Um, and I myself am a, a woman who does triathlon. I'm not very good, but I, I quite like having a go. And something that's always struck me is how few women take part in try so I do kind of the longer distance stuff and sometimes kind of official stats say there are as few as kind of 15 20 percent of those people taking part are women and it's always something that's really made me go why why is that happening and I think you know we can think of some fairly obvious reasons societally but I wanted to kind of delve into that a little bit deeper and at the start of that I decided I wanted to do a try coaching course um, so I can maybe start coaching women um, and find out a little bit more. So I sign up for my coaching course, bright eyed, bushy tailed, very excited. And we get to the section on coaching women and I go, I don't think this can be for real. <laughs> is this is this really what they're promoting? And a lot of the things they were saying about, OK, well, don't make try competitive because women don't want to compete. And um, we've got to think about well-being and make sure that everyone's really happy and it's all happy, cheery. Women, you know, aren't, you know, competitive beings. So let's not make it like that. And I'm sitting there going, well, I'm a woman and try and I like to be competitive. So this really kind of set me up for doing a piece of research into women in the triathlon world. And um, I went did lots of interviews, um, lots of kind of people I know and with kind of pros and beginners and a whole range of women sharing their stories with me, which was really, really fascinating. At the same time, I emailed uh, the governing body for triathlon in the UK and said, OK, I'm doing this research. It's going really well. I'm finding out so many interesting things. I'd love to know where the information came from um, that you're sharing about coaching women. And they came back to me and said, oh, well, we don't really know, but it will have been from reliable sources. And at this point, I put my head in my hands and go, reliable sources. OK, <laughs> very, very good. <laughs> so I kind of went back and said, well, I'd, I'd love to kind of be that reliable source if you'd uh, le let me. And nothing came back. Um, so I think, you know, part of what I'd like to ask you all today is how do we make that happen? How do we make this be the reliable source? Um, but what it came down to is Katrina said, you've kind of got everyone else's stories here, Chloe. I'd really like you to write a story. And this kind of made me feel quite nervous. I thought, oh, I, I don't really know how to do that. I've never written a story before. But I sat down to write and I um, came up with Lady Folk, um, which I will share with you now. It's kind of the first story that I've, I've ever written like this. Um, so it felt kind of a bit uh, vulnerable. But I, I hope you enjoy it. So is this your first triathlon, love? It's really brave of you to start with a half iron man. The familiar fizz of irritation ran through me. Unfortunately, it wasn't the first time I'd been asked this while racking my bike before a race. Oh, well, actually, no, it's not. This is my seventh half iron man, and it's it's my second one this year. I tried not to sound annoyed. I don't think I did a very good job, to be honest. I kept mm. sorting my belongings, checking everything was in working order, and I have everything that I need. My nutrition was laid out, trainers unlaced, sunglasses were in my helmet ready to go. The silence from my new friend makes me look up to see what he's doing. He is looking at me. Well, the uh, just shows, doesn't it? You lady folk can do it. Uh, sorry? 
Shows what? Hang on, sorry. Lady folk? <laughs> what? <laughs> the words race through my mind. I want to challenge him, but I have a race to prepare for. And am I really going to change this man's perspective in the next two minutes? He scans over my belongings. I find it easier to put my sunglasses in my shoe, he says to me. Yep, there it is, I thought. The unsolicited advice. That's nice, I say. And all I can think is that his sunglasses are going to smell like his cheesy feet. So that's... <laughs> um, and I think, yeah, this is where I'd like to kind of open it up to you guys and go, what can we do with lady folk to kind of get that story in with the governing bodies that were so dismissive and to get people listening? Because at the moment I've had quite a lot of, I don't know, people think I've written this story and they go, oh, that's a good story. And then that's kind of the end of the conversation. So I'd be really interested to know how we kind of get over that and how we move forward. Yeah. First of all, Chloe, thank you so much. I think that there are few things more vulnerable than one's first step into storying. Um, and so just to acknowledge that vulnerability as, as you step into that. A couple of things that really uh, uh, caught my attention and my imagination, and then to open it up for some others as well. One is you tell story very well. I think you've got a real ear for detail. So one of the first things I thought was when you said you're a tri-athlete. I'm so non-athlete. I don't, I don't know what a tri is, other than I assume it's three things, right? Um, and so one of the things to think about is what audiences you want to speak to and what those particular audiences might need to know to enter into your story. But coming right after that, as soon as you begin your story, the level of detail that you have fills in all of that context for me, right? right? And so one of the things that I think autoethnography does is doesn't necessarily like an academic paper up front, here's my vocabulary and here's all my citations. In the course of the story, it puts us in there. Um, and so, oh, it has to do with bicycles because she's got a bike and she's doing this and she's got a head. So I am gradually invited into it. And I think that that um, uh, is a testament to what you are as a story maker. You've got, uh, first of all, the, you know, the term lady folk is incredibly rich. And so you might spend some time playing that out. Um, you know, in kind of popular culture, we talk of lady parts, right? Those things that we don't really talk about um, that are behind the scenes. And I think you can play with that. The whole notion of ladylike uh, and folk as a, as a kind of generative or uh, generic term, I think can be very, very rich. And you might at some point want to play a little bit um, about that. One of the details, it, not only that uh, his words kind of smelled like stinky feet, but he stands over my belongings, right? You talk about the oh. man standing over your belongings. Um, paying attention to some of those little details, your belongings, literally the things that you have, but it is also your sense of belonging there. He stands over your belongingness, right? And one of the things that I think story allows is to pay really close attention to some of the descriptors, some of the metaphors, and using those then to um, crack open resonances. Um, and those opened resonances can provide lots of ways in for multiple audiences who may not be schooled in sport necessarily, yeah, if, if that makes sense. Um, so I would say think about which audiences you want to speak to, what those particular audiences need to know, or what languages most uh, appeal to them. Right? I'm coming as a performer, a performer, as a poet, so I'm keying into descriptor, metaphor. Other audiences may key into different details. So always thinking about uh, every storyteller serves up their story according to what that audience needs to hear or would find delicious. Uh, and so keep that in mind as you're thinking. There's never generic story. There is a telling appropriate to an audience or a context. And that might help you find, you know, some um, some different legs. I think you're very charming in presentation, which is to say you make your story come alive. So as you are, are thinking of uh, giving legs to your research, uh, know that one of your strengths is the, uh, the saying, 
right? I think you've got an ear for dialogue as you're recreating that um, and use that kind of natural ability to, to engage with us. Um, story can slip in right without people knowing because we are all storytelling creatures so have 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 trust in that method even though you may not yet have trust in your ability to wield it um and yes you should be the expert you know i think that's a wonderful place for you to start i want to be the reliable source um uh. And so with that said, have wings. You are certainly a reliable source uh, in this moment. So that just is a first initial thing to say to you. Um, and then open up, again, I'm kind of watching our time, um, that we can speak more broadly to everyone with some specifics of where they might think uh, your work could go. But thank you so much. No, thank you. That's incredibly helpful. Thank you. And Marie. Hi, thank you. I noticed Alec has his hand up. Did, did Alec want oh, to say I'm something? So sorry, or... Yes, I didn't see it. Yes, Alec. Unmute yourself, love. I just wanted to put you uh, onto a, a book chapter, uh, Chloe, which I think will be might be helpful for you if you haven't read it already. It's it was in our um, in our edited book, uh, Meaningful Journeys, Autoethnographies of Quest and Identity Transformation, came out earlier this year. And the chapter is by Tina Thomas. She's a, an academic stroke triathlete. The Red Carpet Quest, an Iron, Man's competit an Iron Man competitor's transformational journey. It's really good stuff. Uh, and I, I think it might be useful for you if you haven't come across it. Yeah. My bedtime reading's altered for the next little while. Thank you. I'll put it on the comments to just in case. That'd be ace. Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Chloe. Thanks, Elise. Cheers. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Is that okay? I hope it works. and look at all three of our uh, presenters here. Has Victoria uh, been able to arrive? We didn't see her earlier. No, I don't think so. Okay, then that gives us uh, the luxury of more time. So let's turn our attention then uh, to Mary. Thank you. Generating swoopings and swirlings at sunset and sunrise. This paper is inspired by this year's conference theme, Murmurations, the noise made by the many flapping wings of a group of starlings in flight, taking to the sky at sunset. Reading about murmurations while sitting at a desk one afternoon watching pigeons, crows, magpies and starlings provoked images of thousands of words from the last two years since completing a PhD, flying around in disarray before landing somewhere, a word document, the notepad of a mobile phone, a sheet of paper. Presenting words which have taken flight, swooping and swirling into this becoming conference paper, creating a plane of imminence. This paper tests the water for those words to make themselves heard. Words flow in relation to each other, to surroundings. One word, like one starling, can change the direction, the tone of all the words, the nascence of writing. A badger appears one night, shortly after the sun sets. Soon there are three badgers, appearing from their set between sunset and sunrise, striped black and white faces, long snouts, fur tinged red from the Devon earth. They form an amazing sight, lumbering up the garden steps in search of fruit, monkey nuts, sandwiches. A bread-eating tortoiseshell cat sends the smallest badger running for safety. Two slightly larger badgers jostle over a banana, watched attentively by a small black cat skulking in the shadows. The badgers appear long after a much-loved PhD thesis is forced to a temporary close by an arbitrary submission deadline. The relationship between that PhD thesis and the eight years it was allowed in becoming was always fictional. It needed seven and a half, and a failed first draft, 
to realise what, in Erin Manning's words, the writing was after. Refusing to stop writing until submission day itself, the writing then turns to that liminal space between submission and viva day. And, with no thesis to write, it finds itself increasingly trapped in cycles of becomings of negativity, of fear, of trepidation. And the world, which was crucial in informing thinking with concepts such as assemblage, line of flight and plane of imminence, disappears from writing as writer is subsumed within those cycles. Feeling bereft, she nonetheless continues to write as an always becoming doctor. She writes between sunset and sunrise since that is when the words flow, demanding to be typed in darkness on a mobile phone, the only lighted screen. With eyes straining to stay open, tiredness is fraught as fingers tap out the words as the writing demands to come into the world. It's exciting seeing them appear, whereas accompanying her on the long journeys to a newly started job which saps her soul, a sad lost in the traffic, the wind and rain battering the car. Some of the words return later, but most are lost forever. Starting a different new job a year later, there is still much that frustrates her, but she's excited about planning and facilitating an academic writing workshop for prospective students. She looks at last year's material. Do not write before you have planned what you are going to write. Do not read before you have planned your assessment. This will ensure that you don't waste any time on anything that is not relevant. Oh, she was always reading and writing during her PhD, and even the conventional plan of an academic thesis was soon set aside as she followed the writing wherever it took her. Erin Manning says, and from her experience of writing her PhD, she agrees with her, that, quote, writing only knows what it's after once it has begun to make its way into the world. What's next? Structure, introduction, 10%. Main body, conclusion, 10%, or was it 5 she has no idea what percentage of the thesis her reader's guide was, nor what percentage the postlude or the post-postlude written by the thesis itself once she had gone to bed on submission day were. There's a strict structure for paragraphs too. Peel, point, evidence, explanation. Should that be the other way around? Link. And even a list of academic do's and don'ts. Surely that should be do nots. When, why and how to reference follows. One author, more than three, printed book, ebook, edited book, chapter in an edited book, journal printed, electronic journal with URL or DOI website. The examples go on and on and on. Isn't the idea of the workshop to increase confidence and enthusiasm for writing through exploration and speculation with and in the writing? It's difficult to see how any of this helps students learn to write. When writing, as Elizabeth St. Pierre writes, is never stable and dogmatic, but always already available to reinvention and creation. Students need to experiment, discover what writing does, where it can take them. She knows writing a PhD thesis is different to writing at undergraduate level, in that, for example, it's expected to contribute to new knowledge. But she believes in open inquiry pedagogical spaces at all levels. These provoke new learning, curiosity, critical thinking which educational institutions claim to teach. It was only when she adopted Laura Richardson's method of inquiry and Betty's post-qualitative inquiry that there was movement and openings for change. Then it became possible to challenge orthodox academic writing conventions. Thinking with Deleuze and Guattari, she realises as she writes this that, as they say, there is always difference in repetition. It is those small variations, like the ones in a Stalin speed and flight direction, creating a murmuration which creates pedagogical openings. Paulina Rossio suggests that unplanned, unwanted events, quote, can be evaluated as distractions towards something not planned, yet of potential worth pedagogically. She describes these as post-human literacies and adds that they do not develop in a linear way but depend on other participants and the context, and so cannot be passed down in a master-apprentice model. Bringing post-qualitative inquiry to an autoethnography conference is troubling me now. I'd just like to acknowledge Ken Gale's presence in the writing and his contribution to it here. In his keynote presented here last year, Ken suggests that post-qualitative inquiry problematizes autoethnography, not only because of the I, the auto, 
In his opening sentence, Ken stresses that biting is a compulsion which takes over in the fragility of I. In raising questions about how to extend autoethnography beyond conventional humanist qualitative inquiry, beyond neurotypical and simply human practices, what strikes me is Ken's attunement, animation of inquiry, free and wild creation of concepts, enabling speculations and experimentations not previously imagined. But as Ken argues, conventional autoethnographic practice usually constrains these doings. Writing takes over from the eye, he says. We need to be alert to the elusivity of the eye as not being representable, but always becoming, always in conceptual play. I showed Ken this writing and he said, this is key. This is where writing in itself in moves into and with moments of imminence, troubling its descriptivist and representational tendentiousness. Writing is indeed a force. It's the Saturday before the conference, and I realise what I thought was eight minutes is at least 12. I remember yeah. Ken's ponderings last year over what to leave on the cutting room floor, and know it's time to make those decisions. However, is this perhaps an example of when we should stop our neurotypicality taking over and controlling the writing? What if I simply leave the writing as it is and stop here, simply because the eight minutes are up? And so she's left wondering how the bodies in this space have affected this body of writing in progress. And if and how this body of writing has affected the other bodies in this welcoming, safe space. Thank you for listening. Uh, Wonderful example, Mary. Um, and you cite Ken Gale, and I would cite this as a beautiful response to a taking up and a carrying forward of so much that Ken represents in his work um, and articulated last year uh, in his keynote. A uh, couple of things that I would point out that, that struck me so powerfully. One is it's a, a wonderful example of a post-humanist um, kind of perspective, that we begin with the animals. I'm in scene, I'm looking at, but through those perspectives. And so you are really dislodging the, I am the human making sense in the center of the world, um, right from the very, I think from the very beginning. This notion of the I, meaning the singular you know, narrator, you are really playing with in some wonderful ways. So rather than I speaker, the I, E-Y-E, right? The I, the, the perceiver. And so switching from one kind of I to, to have an eye on the world, on becoming. And so your uh, reflections and the observations that you see are in the writing doing what you are calling for writing to do if that makes sense. You're demonstrating what, what you are calling for. Um, one of the first words I wrote down was brave and courageous. Because you talk about all the stumbling blocks that academic culture puts in the way of collaboration, uh, post-humanistic perspectives, the poetic. And while you are describing them, you are describing them in terms that resist all of them. So again, that sense of fusing a uh, form and function, theme and how it's being, you know, particularly uh, articulated. One thing I really want to point out is how beautifully you are integrating citation, right? Um, and so you're citing Deleuze, you're citing Manning, you're citing Laurel Richardson, Ken Gale, at times without that academic, and now I shall use another's voice, end quote. But in the ways that I think research lives in us, in the slippage and slide between my voice, another's voice, what it helps me to see, that there is a murmuration, you know, if I can continue that metaphor, of multiple voices. And I think you are demonstrating that, uh, certainly in the course of it. You talk about uh, light, about uh, the kind of, I'm thinking of sunrise, sunsets, the, the only light being from your screen. These are uh, spaces of liminality, spaces of being betwixt and between, neither day 
nor night, neither poem nor citation, but both. And those are the places of transformation, right? Liminality certainly comes from, you know, rituals of transformation um, when we become something other. And so I'm really hearing those metaphors and your method of writing, speaking right into the liminal spaces where we are both and the space of becoming, right? Which is that delusion always, I'm um, always becoming. You had a phrase, writing only knows what it's after when it is, and I didn't get the rest of it, but whatever the rest of the phrase was about being in the world, you know, over and over, I think you are taking up and rephrasing so many of these um, wisdoms about the writing process and putting it on display in the moment of the writing. Um, and so kudos for doing that, not only speaking about it in a way that merges a poetic and a quote unquote academic uh, voice or different discourses, not different voices, but, you know, with somewhat different languages. Um, but you're really putting that um, on display over and over again. Really loved where you're going with that and look forward to, you know, continuing to see the rest of your work in those wider spaces. And if you are teaching people to write, you are the kind of dissertation uh, advisor that many people need, right? That breaks those boundaries um, and that writes bravely into those spaces where people have said, you can't do that. You can't talk in that way. Um, and so for opening those spaces for your own students, you know, certainly kudos, we can all learn from that. Thank you so much, Mary. No, thank uh, you. You said things uh, now I hadn't even thought of. So, yeah, thank you so much. <laughs> absolutely. You're very kind. Can I open up to the broader community for, um, we have plenty, I think another 15 minutes. I think, according to my clock, to hear from some other perspectives. Um, we have uh, extraordinary writers there. So, please just. Can I speak, Elise? Please, David. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Firstly, thank you all three of you sharing the work. It's been really valuable hearing that. Thank you, Elise. It's always a learning experience for me hearing you respond, even though you're not responding to my work. Elise's subtitle of Elise's presentation tomorrow is The Art and Ethics of Critical Response. And you've just given us a beautiful demonstration of that. Thank you. The next thing I would like to say, I'd like to introduce uh, Georgia Thompson from Ratledge, who is here with us as well. Um, and welcome to contribute, uh, Georgia, and you, if you like, at any point. I, can I just offer a few responses to Chloe specifically, partly because I'm also from a sport, exercise, health science background. And there's a, a few things I sort of like to share if I could. The first one is that. At least already said the title is just the best title. It's one of the best titles I've come across. It's fantastic. It's so rich. There's so much there. Brian yesterday was talking about a teachable moment and that little story that you've identified, that experience, it's just a beautiful teachable moment. So keep doing what you're doing because that's great work. That will stay with me, that title and that, that vignette. The same thing that I was also thinking about is um, there's an Irish novelist called John Boyne who's talked in an interview recently, was talking about, he, he works a lot around various forms of oppression and injustice. And he's written his, his novels, he thinks are often around that, but he's seen that the theme isn't so much the perpetrators, but the sort of bystanders. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm thinking one of the ways you're saying, how could you develop that work? We're all part and parcel of this sexism and all the other, many of the other isms as well. Right. So I'd be really interested in whether you can use some of your own experience, maybe future research with other women around how those sorts of uh, exchanges or moments are kind of permitted by us, some of us. Not just people that do it, but people that sort of tolerate it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and the third thing, is I'm sort of concerned about you, for your welfare really. So I, um, I asked a colleague 20 odd years ago who worked in a sport and health science department, is the emphasis on the sport or the health? And he said the emphasis is on the science. 
And I, it's, it's hurt me living in that environment and trying to do this kind of work. So I think it's great, as Elisa's saying, is how do you find ways to communicate with the people that need to hear this stuff within that world? But I think it's also alongside that really important to protect yourself. And for me, that's about these kinds of communities, being in spaces where people are open to your ways of working, open to you sharing your experience, to sort of bolster yourself and be able to sort of go into gladiatorial combat when and if necessary. So I think it, it's, you know, it's great that you're here and um, I think that's really important to stay connected to supportive communities as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if I may follow um, David, which is always a pleasure because he sort of um, uh, jumps into my head and says things that, that are, are literally about to come out of my mouth. And so, um, you know, what a wonderful panel. And I know that the intention, intentionality of this panel is not the relational connections between the three, three uh, presenters, but I'm very much interested in the connections um, that bind all three of these presentations together. And partially for you to be able to maybe um, articulate some of the insights that you gained and garnered through each other's presentations and definitely from the brilliance, you know, of my teacher, colleague, friend, Alice Pinel, right? Um, I'm very interested in a Chloe, um, in your presentation and the notion of reliable sources and your appropriate questioning of who those reliable sources are, as well as maybe a quest of being and becoming a reliable source for so many others. Um, and in Marie's presentation, I love, you know, the beginning of that question, you know, where are you from? And the ways in which we all have to find a way of becoming reliable sources and respond to that very nature, the very nature of that question, either from our own lived experience or the inheritance, right, of being and the ways in which we narrate the question, our response to the question of where are you from, right? Because from is not uh, a geographical location as much as it's the, the historicity of our being and becoming, right? And how we narrate that. And whoever is asking the question is quite often looking for a wide variety of different kinds of ways of trying to pinpoint us, to fix us in time and place and location. And then in Mary's presentation, to begin with this notion of the failed first draft of our story, right, is a very powerful thing, right? Because in some ways, the failed first draft of a dissertation, right, is in many ways our story. Right, you know, and it becomes very personal, right? Uh, and very visceral when we get that kind of response about a failure of a first draft, right? Because we're so implicated in the very telling, right? So I'm interested in maybe what the three of you may have encountered as bits and pieces of yourselves, of your own journey within the context of both presenting your individual work, the brilliant way of least sort of providing meaningful feedback but how you might tie some of her feedback in relation to your own journey. Does that make sense? So the teacher in me would, would put you on the spot right now. <laughs> <laughs> just to see, just to see if there were resonances in those three and the other two presentations for each of you. I think there's definitely something in there around challenge. I think all of us have picked up on something where we've gone, hang on, wait a minute, something isn't quite right here, or I, I don't know how this is being done or it isn't being done. Um, uh, I was definitely listening to some of that going, oh yeah, that's definitely something that I've had or experienced. And even if it's not kind of directly, it's maybe that feeling of, you know, I've, I've come across a situation that has made me feel like that. Um, so I think even if it's not directly our stories are all kind of very different, but there's definitely feeling in there where I've gone, oh yeah, <laughs> I get that. That's made me feel. Yeah, I, I feel I've learned so much from hearing it, all of you talk. And even though, like you say, um, 
they're not linked topics. I feel that we're completely linked by the way that we are, I don't know, are we tiptoeing? <laughs> we're kind uh, of tiptoeing into this. It's risky and it's vulnerable and it's exposing and it's not what we've normally been saying. But now we're we're wanting to dive in, in and say it. Um, I, Mary, you captured it really well with all those contradictions and questions and and i think we're all in that same boat and that's really comforting <laughs> it, it, it really it really brings it alive in that community sense very much yeah i don't know if that makes sense but that's that's the that's the emotion i'm left with it's like oh yeah here we are <laughs> yeah yeah i felt i felt the same i mean there was so much in both of yours that really resonated with me especially that kind of resistance and also that fight um mm. I felt immediately with with Chloe what you were saying when you were saying about the lady folk straight away I was thinking yeah it's it's a different um obviously um different circumstances but that feeling of you know I want to do something about this was there and um Marie there's something you said about um all your stories take you back there and I just really related to that as well, because all my stories take me back to um, basically the PhD years. So I felt with all three of us, there was um, just so much there that, that resonated. Can I just say something, just very briefly, it's very funny that it's all women that have come to an in-progress session. I spotted that. <laughs> I'll leave that with you. <laughs> you can carry on, Elise. Cheers to the lady folk, um, but also cheers to uh, the men in the audience that I'm looking at here, um, who are here listening and, and engaging too. Um, a quick uh, comment about style. Um, as I look across kind of the three of you and try and make some uh, connections there, one of the wonderful things about autoethnography is that there is not a single voice to do it. Like, here's how you do that. As I look at the three, you know, I'd kind of characterize Chloe's as in the dramatic mode, in scene, using dialogue. This is what this person said and that person. So very much in the dramatic uh, mode. Um, Anne Marie is working very much in terms of story, uh, narrative fragments being there, being here. Um, and Mary, I think I would hear you working very much in a lyric mode. This is a consciousness moving in and out around different times, but very located in a in a, a poetic lyric voice. So again, just drawing on some of those literary devices, it is a good testament to the range or spectrum with which we can develop our own voices, that there's not a single way to do it. Um, we are as different in our vocality as we are in the disciplines where we may be housed. Um, and, and you've shown that diversity and the richness um, of that diversity. Yes. I just wanted to, if I can, uh, it's a sort of reflection back to the reflection. Um, and I, I, apart from anything else, I think, I, I, I suppose, re reinforcing the, 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 the comment that it is uh, interesting that we've had three presentations from women um, where I can sort of very much see a, a kind of linked team. I think it's already been reflected by others, but I'll put it basically. I think it's, 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 there's something about, for me, what's in common is should and ought. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, uh, with Mary, your, your, your PhD, I, I think mean, it's hilarious. You know, this 10% this uh, should be in this section and 40% in this section, whatever. Um, and as if that should sort of constrain. Um, you, you, uh, some classes should be in, you know, um, your training is clearly, yeah. You know, um, and there should be a way, Anne Marie, for you to describe your, of course, like all of us, uniquely complex identity uh, and um, self, you know, uh, identity of, of where I'm from, um, what that means to me, uh, who's asking now. Uh, so, you know, 
to me, the thing about resisting, I don't know if that's helpful at all, but I, I just really wanted to reinforce the kind of like what I think is already been said about, you know, like it is great. So putting it sort of just in the, in the positive way to not say another ought. It's just great that you are questioning, yeah. resisting uh, that. You know, this should go here, and by the way, it should be fifteen percent. And by the way, this is a term that 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 defines it. I just think that's just so important. So my final thing on that that ties it maybe together a little bit. Um, I'm and I'm, I'm not sure what I think actually, but because I'm I'm, I'm just wondering. I'm thinking loud. I'm wondering how useful. This notion of reliability is Chloe. Uh, like you know, like you know, what what is a, a, a reliable source? Does such a, a, a thing exist? It sounds to me worryingly like, oh, I've always relied on that because I've never questioned it. So I've always relied on this self-description, or I've always relied on that way of approaching, um, like um, you know, uh, why why there aren't more, uh, there aren't more women uh, participating in triathlon events, or, or you know, I I I feel so many people want to celebrate unreliability. <laughs> We are unfortunately at the end of our time, so perhaps we can take that question and that query about the reliability of sources and take it into lunch together. Um, and you all can talk about that uh, in that space. Can we take this last moment to really thank these wonderful uh, writers for their skill, their vulnerability and the things that they gave us uh, to take away. Thank you all so, so much. <laughs>